Hello, everyone. We are having another episode of Sketchy Talk. I know it's been a couple weeks, but the Kickstarter is over. And thanks, patrons, for supporting me for so long on it. And thanks, people from Kickstarter who supported it. We're working very hard on finishing the book. And obviously, if you've been following this Patreon, you've been seeing our journey so far. And last time we interviewed Claire Finney, who was our graphic designer. So today we are going to interview Noelle Rivera, who has worked as a professional editor for 10 years. Her previous roles include managing editor of FNW Media's Northlight and Impact book imprints, where she specialized in fine arts and art technique books. Noelle received her bachelor's degree in media arts and animation from the Art Institute of Fort Lauderdale and her bachelor's in editing, writing, and media from Florida State University. She currently works with the Artist's Magazine, Writer's Digest, and private clients in the freelance capacity. So welcome, Noelle. Thank you. <laughs> So, Noelle, um, you have edited many art books and had a, this as an experience in your previous working life. How did you get into editing art books? You said, were telling me earlier that you have an art degree. How did you go from art degree to editing? I mean, I guess it feels like a natural link. Yeah, it ended up it ended up being that um, even if I think when most people go into publishing, they're probably thinking about fiction and whatnot. But, you know, I had an artistic background and I ended up going back to college because for various reasons, I couldn't move to any of the parts of the country where I could get a job in animation. It was just too expensive. Um, so I ended up going back to school because the other thing besides my love for art was my love for books. And editing and reading other people's work and helping them with it was something I always really enjoyed. So um, I did that. And then uh, after I finished uh, college again, <laughs> I, I applied to um, FNW Media. I actually originally applied to their craft imprint because I was a crafter and I had the art background um, and the editing now uh, in education. So I ended up on their craft team and then transitioned into their art group which was a lot of fun because, you know, now the books that I was editing were books I had used in art school, you know, as I was learning all the Northlight and the Impact books. So it was kind of a um, coincidental and um, I guess a coincidental um, opportunity that I was able to package all of my skills and education into working for them. Well, that's pretty exciting. And and you've done gotten to work on some really interesting art books and work with some really um, interesting sketchers, actually. Um, and, you know, a lot of the people that are on the Patreon and also the Back to Kickstarter are very much into sketching as a practice. And we were talking just before we started recording, you had mentioned you actually are a sketcher as well. Obviously, being in animation and that sort of thing, they go hand in hand. Uh, do you do it much as a practice still? I do. Uh, it's on and off for me, depending on what other which other of my hobbies I'm focused on at the time. But for the most part, I would say sketching for me is something I've done, you know, more than anything else. Um, so, you know, I may not go to a site and sketch all the time, but I'll stay at my house and draw my cats or draw my rooms <laughs> with all of their stacks of books and things like that. So I've got one journal dedicated to interior sketches where I, you know, sketch the indoors of shops or my house or things like that. So yeah, I've been really into that lately too. I I've been like on game nights I'll sketch and uh, when I'm at home, you know, I like I sketched us preparing Thanksgiving dinner and and that <laughs> sort of thing. I mean, perhaps my family would prefer me to cook more and draw less, but <laughs> that it, sounds really, like my dad. Why are you drawing that rock? <laughs> exactly, but there's a lot of really interesting, and there's a couple prominent sketchers that do a lot of that sort of stuff that you would never think. Oh, this is a good topic to sketch. They do amazing sketches of interiors of coffee shops and restaurants and that sort of thing, and it's really fun to practice to do. Yeah, um, I I really enjoy it, and I think I started doing that after I saw some of those people after I got into researching urban sketching as part of my job at F&W. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, this is cool. <laughs> and so I would, you know, look at those people's Instagrams or books or whatever it was that they had out. And um, yeah, and I got a lot of inspiration from them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting practice. And I think it's really taken off since 
I th I think when when I first started volunteering for the Urban Sketchers, they were celebrating their tenth anniversary, which I think was twenty seventeen, and it was really interesting just how big this worldwide organization is. And now that I work with sort of the main organization a lot for social media, it's just amazing. I think that's one reason I fell in love with it is not just that I love to draw all the time, but it is such a worldwide practice. Like you see it every country in the world, there's chapters and it shows just how many similarities there are from people of all cultures and all languages that they all love to draw the world around them which so drawing the interiors and your stacks of books and that sort of thing that's a really important practice and and since my day job is mostly illustrating children's books a lot of that stuff really helps you with every practice with every part you do professionally yep absolutely i would definitely agree and we also find we we I was talking about it with Amy Bogart a little bit uh, when we first talked on the first talk she actually wrote the um, forward to the book is it's almost like a meditation too it's a way to relax when you're really stressed out um, and I that's one reason I like to do it outside too it's almost like tree bathing yep <laughs> exactly I've definitely done that when I felt myself getting stressed I'll either draw designs in my sketchbook or whatever happens to be on my desk just so I can put my mind into a different space mm -hmm. and get around whatever it is that's stressing me out. You mentioned that you were a crafter. Do you do any of the sort of like Zen tangles or anything like that as well? Or I've done something similar. I I don't know if what I'd call what I do Zen tangle, but I guess that's kind of in that same vein. I do a lot of spirals and like big designs uh, using different shapes and things like that. Um, I don't know if they're as intricate as <laughs> some people's Zen tangles, but but it, that that to me is something I started doing in like 2006 when I realized that it was very much a way for me to meditate kind of um, and focus on drawing a design that just intuitively. Um, so I definitely, yeah, do a lot of that. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, do you ever, you said that you didn't, I mean, have you ever considered doing animation again or do you feel like that, that you're not as into it into anymore? I mean, it seems now more than ever working remotely as an animator is possible, but it de it depends if you want to do it too. I mean, yeah, I think my role when I was in school, I was more into the character creation portion and I, I can create characters all day. <laughs> like, <laughs> like I 100% of someone was like, Hey, we want you to come on board and make characters for us. I'll be like, great. That's awesome. Um, the actual animation that was never really my jam as much. Um, mm -hmm. but, uh, I definitely did character creation. Um, I did, uh, sort of digital painting. I don't really digitally paint anymore. I mostly do watercolor, but, um, I did, I don't know if I've ever told you this, but I did background paintings for the SpongeBob SquarePants video game that was connected to the first film. Oh, cool. Um, so that was one thing I did when I was still in animation. Um, yeah, so for sure, I would definitely create characters, though, if anybody asked. <laughs> uh -huh. well, that's really cool. I mean, you know, they. The, the, that's a great thing about anyone's long career or in my case in freelancing is sometimes you end up doing stuff that's very, I mean, I've done some animation backgrounds before too. Yeah. Um, you know, you can, you end up working on a lot of different stuff and that's kind of the cool thing about what we do. I mean, I always feel like it's bad to get too pigeonholed doing something. Um, I agree. But getting back to talking about uh, working with the, working as an editor, what is what, what was the process like when you worked at FNW? What was the process like? Where did you usually get the manuscript, you know, for people that are interested in doing this type of publishing? What would you suggest that they submit to people that are looking or were you involved in that process? Or did you get after the upper management said selected what they needed for their list, then you got it? Or how what was that process? I definitely did less acquisitions than other people, but I did do some acquisitions. So um, I would say, you know, if if doing a book for a company is something you want to do, 
then you definitely want to put together, you know, a portfolio and have a concept. Um, you, it's not a great idea to just have like a bunch of different types of art and then just be like, here's everything because publishers are looking for an, a concept that's like hits a niche that they want and that they think people will be interested in. So it's got to kind of have a theme to it. Um, I would say think about that, you know, build your pitch around that kind of thing. Um, definitely if possible have an online presence because that's how that's how we found most of the people we approached for acquisitions was through their Instagram or their website or at conventions so if you're able to have any of those things or go you know have an art table at a convention of any kind that's always a benefit um also let's see what else uh, yeah, make network if I mean, I know I know it's harder to network these days maybe than it used to be. Um, but you know, make connections where you can find them or go to sketching groups like, you know, urban sketchers if that's your kind of thing or whatever, whatever group that does the kind of art you're interested in. Um, go there and make connections and just kind of branch out um with people in that in that community and area of the art industry. Um and I would say, you know, have, when you put your pitch together, you want to clearly state your concept, sort of explain to the editor sort of what it is that you, you know, think this is going to do for people who do art, like what, what um, demographic is it going to hit? Uh, what interest is it going to generate in maybe other books along the same line? People are really always interested in beginner topics. We found that that is really popular. So if you do something that's maybe different that other people might want to know how to do, that's always a big, a big sell. Um, and just write clearly and concisely. <laughs> Editors have a ton on their plates all the time. Um, so the more quickly you can convey what it is you want to convey, the the better, um, the better mm -hmm. your chances will be that they'll, you know, get in touch. Mm -hmm. It seems like since F and W is gone, that there's actually a big hole in this um segment of publishing um who is filling the hole is it smaller publishers i know penguin or random house didn't they take some titles but yeah i gosh i've kind of been out of the like larger publishing circuit for a little bit but there are other publishers who you know do similar things um i think fox chapel might be one mm -hmm. um watson gupsel but they do more in like technical books mm -hmm. um uh, penguin random house did take our art imprints and finish up the you know the original line that we had i don't know mm -hmm. if they've made more under those imprints or not i honestly haven't checked <laughs> so, um it, it feels like publishing is really changing a lot now yeah um and I'm not sure exactly where it's going to end up. And I don't know if that it's not necessarily a bad or a good thing. It's just different, yeah. um, especially with the advent of things like Reedsy, for example, um, which is a basically a freelance database of editors and designers that worked in publishing, you know, but no longer work for the big major publishers and that sort of thing. Yeah, And it seems like that's kind of, I, I almost am thinking that a lot of publishers are going to be more curating rather than buying original content. Um, you know, this is a sideline, but I know you write fiction. Mm -hmm. It seems like the hottest areas in fiction right now are not book publishing. It's online fiction. There's people that have huge followings. And... Yeah. You know, it seems like when they actually do get a book deal, that probably sells less than they already sell, you know, online to their fan base. Yeah, I think the per the ones who benefit the most from those scenarios are the publishers because mm -hmm. they're getting the benefit of your existing fan base. Yes. So, um, you know, it's like, oh, this person came in with, you know, I don't know, 20,000 readers. Well, now there are 20,000 readers and <laughs> we can convince them maybe to buy more books, mm -hmm. uh, you know, off of our catalog. Um, and of course, you know, once they have that author on board, they can have them keep writing and mm -hmm. keep selling. So, yeah, yeah. It, it 
Oh, go on. Sorry. Oh, no, no. I was just saying there are a lot of other outlets now, um, depending on who you are and how good you are at generating momentum for your product. Um, mm-hmm. You could you can get a lot without, you know, going a traditional route. Well, I was thinking also of comics as a good example. Like my students are all huge readers of Webtoon, for example. Mm-hmm. And Laura Olympus has been so popular. I don't know if you read that one. I haven't, but I know it. Um, but I think it, it is, I, I bought the graphic novel, but it is, you know, hugely popular. And, and so it seems like the way people are taking in media and reading and getting books is really changing. Yeah. I mean, it seems like art books actually might be a segment where people want a paper book more. Mm hmm. Yeah, there are definitely cases for that. And especially depending on your age group, like if books are something you were accustomed to before, mm-hmm. you know, video instruction and stuff like that. Um, but also people just like to have and look at the images, you know, even mm-hmm. as a student buying instructional books, I don't know that I ever actually read the text. I just looked at the picture. <laughs> that was kind of how I, that's kind of how I am too. I, I mean, I, actually most of my art books I mean, I have some that are instruction books. Most of my art books are animation books because yes. I love <laughs> like Spirit of, my Spirit of, copy of this Art of Spirited of Way is looks like it's been through a small war because it's got paint <laughs> all over it and it's all wrinkled and stuff because it tends to be on my desk where I paint often because I love that book. Yes. And there's a couple other ones that I really love looking through, you know, as a painter and I think that's the way a lot of artists are. You know, we have our favorite books that we look at when we're painting. Yeah, um, exactly. And I mean, there, there is reading too. I mean, uh, you know, when it comes to say reading fiction, because I've always been a, been a big reader of fiction. I mean, I'm embarrassed to say most of the time I listen to Audible now <laughs> while I'm painting. Easy to do while you're working. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, and, and when we're on road trips too, I mean, it's I love listening to audiobooks my husband argues that that's not the same as reading them and i suppose it isn't but it's different but the question is what's your goal right like do you want to hear that do you just want to know the story and enjoy it or are you you know reading it like i do have to do sometimes because Mm -hmm. i write fiction for frankly for instructional purposes (laughs) but if i just want to enjoy the story i don't mind listening to it you know so now are there uh going back to editing um, you know, having worked in children's books for years and more, I've been more on the art end. So I get hired to illustrate stuff. So I'm not usually part of the editorial process from a writing standpoint, but are there pet peeves for editors? Like, for example, a lot of editors for children's books, they don't actively dislike verse. They dislike most of the verse that they get because it's terrible. Is there something that like, you would get submission wise when you were working on art books that would make you cringe oh man that's a good question let me think I think (laughs) when I would get things from authors and it it wasn't so much that they were intentionally trying to not explain themselves but that they just didn't know how to or realize that they weren't explaining themselves so I would get all this material and be like here I I wrote you some step-by-steps and I would read it and I'm like no you (laughs) (laughs) this is a very general paragraph that no one's going to like really understand what you're talking about so you know it's it's frustrating but it's also like sort of just kind of par for the course when you're dealing with people who are not writers as much as they're artists and that's okay so part of my job is to help them understand that we need to expound on this information and Mm -hmm. um you know, how to do that and what readers are looking for. Um, Sometimes I'd had authors who just plain did not want to write out the instructions. They're like, I don't know how to explain this and I'm not going to. And I'm like, okay, well, I will, because I know what you're trying to say. And I, you know, would sort of Mm. fill it in. But um, of course, with their review, I wouldn't just, you know, put that Mm -hmm. in and publish it. Um, They always would check it first. But um, yeah, so that was sort of a frustration when you kind of get your promised 10 full chapters and you get something that's sort of like 20 pages of you know vagary but Mm -hmm. 
again, that's part of my job is to fix it. <laughs> so <laughs> that's sort of the editor's job is a, being the fixer of, you know, mm-hmm. the things that aren't working. Well, I would assume sometimes there is a bit of ghostwriting involved as well, mm-hmm. just because of the nature of technical writing. Yeah. Is, is so, I mean, having just written this, it was writing, the writing aspect of it is difficult because it's, it is being read by somebody that's not necessarily that even aware of you or know you that well. And you're trying to explain something so it's clear enough to somebody to pick it up and say, oh, I get what this is. And to make it clear and concise, I mean, I think the hardest thing is writing concisely. Yeah, writing concisely without losing your voice. That's the hard part. It's easy to just write dry technical information, but writing it in a way that's engaging and that still expresses yourself, um, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, part of my job was, you know, yes, to get the information across to the reader, but also to preserve the author's personality within that, so... Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So do you think that these types of books t- end up being more vernacular than, say, uh, other types of technical books where it's like more conversational? 100%. Yeah. Um, one of the things that we would always tell authors, because, you know, some of these people haven't written anything since like 12th grade English or college. And, and even then we didn't get the best grades. I'm just saying <laughs> And, you know, and we'd have to be like, okay, you're not writing a research paper. It is 100% okay. And we encourage the use of contractions, <laughs> you know? So it's just like, you can relax a little bit. You don't have to write, you're not writing a treatise on the topic. You're writing, you know, a mm-hmm. book to explain to a person. It's like, imagine you're having a chat with, you know, a friend and that's kind of the tone you want to take mm-hmm. instead of, you know, having a thesis and an outline for all of it. Because you don't want it to be, like we described, this is not a practice where it's a wall of text that someone's looking at. I mean, a picture's worth a thousand words. And so the most important thing is also, you know, how the images show what you're describing. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, you know, that's why sometimes when I get images and I'll be like, okay, can you write a caption for this? Because you don't need to write a whole, you know, paragraph about it just a, a line or or two just to kind of clarify what it's what it is but you know give you the con the reader the context mm-hmm. but the point of it is the image this is just like mm-hmm. for them if they're curious you know what I mean mm-hmm. so do you is there and I know people ask me this all the time if there's a favorite book you but was there I mean was there a book that you worked on that you got a lot of professionally out of that you really enjoyed and felt like it worked really well when you finished working with that it was very satisfying experience I don't know if I best is the is a hard word because yeah (laughs) um but was there a project that you worked on that you found particularly rewarding gosh they're they were also different and also Mm -hmm. cool you know what I mean um I remember working with Kathy Nichols on what was it called the storytellers Oh man, <laughs> I think it was the, I don't know if it was the Storyteller's Bible, um, but Kathy Nichols, uh-huh. I'll have to I'll have to send you the the title, but um, working with her was really interesting because she was so intuitive about her approach to her art, and she was using encaustic and acrylic. And, oh, interesting. Yeah, and she would like do the pre sketches, um. But then, you know, have these different materials that she would lay in, you know, in layers. And but she was doing it from the position of a storyteller. That's where the title came from. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, she's telling a story with the art, which is of course what we all sort of do. Um, but she was doing it intentionally and yet letting her intuition drive her. And so just watching her do that um when we had her in studio and we're taking photographs and then getting to you know write you know see her write and around those images um was really enjoyable for me as a storyteller and an artist at the same time and um yeah her whole vibe is just so great <laughs> so that i really really interesting I, yeah. i'll have to look that up and, and you know storytelling is such a huge part of all of art i mean that's one thing in urban sketchers that we've been trying to 
push more is is storytelling and what's the story about this rather than oh i've just drawn this building what is the story why did you draw this building why did you draw this coffee shop what was it about it that was interesting and start recording not just that you're drawing this image but like start capturing the world around you and make notes about it and and say what was interesting about it what happened while you were there did you overhear a conversation you know something like that that really starts to archive your life in your sketchbook too yes exactly and it's like I've seen travel sketchers do it and people who just sketch in general and I've done it too like you say you're kind of writing a visual diary Mm -hmm. where you you know add some storytelling elements to your like in the moment capture of what's going on around you and I just I think that's really cool and I do too such a great thing to look back on you know Mm -hmm. so you can kind of tell what you were doing and it helps you remember what you were doing too like I mean I I like theater a lot and a lot of times I'll sketch when I'm at theater when we see show comedy shows or go see plays or whatever I always think that's really fun to kind of sketch during those too and it actually remembers helps me remember what I've seen play wise obviously you don't really do that in a movie theater and actually (laughs) I haven't been in a movie theater really a long time (laughs) it seems like it's one of those practices we used to do a lot but we don't do that much anymore going to movie theaters yeah I've been a few times recently they're only just starting to fill back up like you know on an opening Mm -hmm. weekend the only thing I've seen recently is death on the Nile (laughs) Um, and and we my mom and I went to see that during the day but every time something comes out even if I want to see it it turns out that it's coming out like in a couple of weeks on Disney plus or something <laughs> like that. And, and, and I'm like, well then what's the point of going out to see it now? Yeah. You know, it's I, um, in... Oh no, go ahead. Go on. Go on. Oh no, no I was going to say this is only, this is tangentially related to the topic of art, I guess. But I, I recently saw the menu, which mm-hmm. I expected to be a super weird horror film and it was in its way, but like, at the end of the story, you realize that the message was like the disillusionment of an artist for his art, you know, or whatever it is that he does to the point where he just wants to self-immolate and him himself and everyone around him. It's just like, <laughs> I relate to that though. <laughs> Sometimes it's like when society is like sucked the fun out of it. And mm-hmm. I think as artists, we all try to avoid that, you know, so mm-hmm. well, I feel that- like I hit a hit a nerve. <laughs> Well, you know, that's one reason I really started doing sketching and sketchbooks is because, and, you know, obviously this is in the video for uh, the Kickstarter, but it's really easy when you draw for a living to get burnt out, no matter how fun it looks, Yeah. whether you're doing, um, you know, artwork for Dungeons and Dragons or Magic the Gathering or book covers or, you know, uh, children's books. I mean, all the stuff I get to work on has been really interesting. But you can still get burnt out because there's that high level of render. There's the, you know, there's all this stuff that you have to do. And the thing that appealed to me about keeping a sketchbook is just that it wasn't for anyone. I like doing artwork just for myself that's low stakes that I can just play around with and do whatever I feel like. And it doesn't really matter. I mean, and even thinking about sketching for social media, I don't post nearly all of the sketches that I draw. Yeah. You know, a lot of times I'll draw something and then I forget to post it or (laughs) because it's just a practice to kind of, I I think part of it's the meditation and part of it is being able to just sort of let yourself go and just draw what you feel like. And you don't, you're not doing it for a client. You're not doing it for anyone else. And that really, I think, counteracts burnout in a big way. Yes, I totally agree. I've always found that if I try to force myself into a, into a, um, I don't know what you would call it, a habit, an art habit where, you know, I'm doing certain things and only these certain kinds of things that exhausts me. And I just want to do what I want to do when I want to do it. And, and like you say, sketching to no particular purpose, but just the thing that I want to sketch in the moment is definitely been a better um, sort of, you know, life habit to pick up than try to beat or march to somebody else's drum, so to speak. <laughs> Exactly. Now, you also mentioned you do crafting. What kind of crafts do you do? Oh, what don't I do? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I knit, I crochet, I quilt, 
I I still cl- clothes, but not recently because that they're it's hard <laughs> to get dimensions correctly. Um, I I've recently started paper crafting, so I paper craft and make little journals. Oh, neat and things. And uh, I last year I was making acrylic papers and watercolor papers, so I basically just put some paper into like water and then put my watercolor on top of it and then would like shift the page around and lift it out and it would get stained uh with watercolor and then I use those in the journals <laughs> so, oh nice yeah I sounds really cool tried polyclay but that wasn't really for me um <laughs> I would say you know the sewing and the paper craft and the yarn work are more my speed uh-huh. So you make your own books and stuff and do the... Yeah, not not all the time. Um, I like making the um, the signatures and then just making a bunch of them. And then I've, I've learned this new type of binding where I'm not sewing them into the book. I'm just twine binding is what it's called. So oh. you like wrap the twine around them at certain tension and uh, interval and it holds the book and then you tie all of that together into the back um so it's easy to take it in and out if I wanted to oh that's looks, really interesting yeah it looks really cool it has a cool spine uh, when you do that uh-huh. I've actually been talking to Amy about doing because one of the things she used to do for her Taos workshop was she would have you make your own journal yeah whether you'd buy a book and cut the pages out of it and then insert new ones or if you would make your own and we've been talking about maybe doing one of those workshops again uh, there's a group. Do you ever work with the group in Essex that does the paper, the journals, and there's a book making club kind of thing at Essex. Oh no, I didn't know that. <laughs> and and they're I pretty. And and they're pretty cool. Um, but we've been talking about maybe doing one of those again because it's been a while, and yeah. it's really fun. I've I've never really gotten into making my own sketchbooks, but I think it might be fun to try it out. I didn't actually do it when we did when we did the Taos workshop, but I had friends that did. And so is it like traditional book binding or more like um wait, what would you call it like reuse so uh, it was both like okay. I, I i believe that the workshops had both like you could okay. either like cover with fabric some cardboard and and make your um you know book binding thing and then sew it in or you could take an existing book and then cut the papers out and put um new watercolor paper in That's so cool. there was a couple different ways that you did it um actually i have a, a link uh, my friend vanessa made me a, a sketchbook a couple of years ago that has she's a printmaker so it has a cicada on it and then it's got it's it's a really cool book i took it to guatemala when we sketched i'll have to send a link because she actually did a she's done she's done a couple on her blog step by steps on how to make your own journal or your own cool. book and it, it's a really interesting process that is cool yeah I just started making some new inserts like two days ago I just get a wild hair pull out all the supplies and start folding sheets of paper together so yeah um, I'll probably have a new journal by by the end of December <laughs> <laughs> I only just found the one I made last December <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, all of those are, are, are processes, though, that, again, it's it's sometimes it's it's interesting because somebody a friend sent me. There's been a lot of debate about AI, and I know we're kind of going in. But this person sent me a note saying, I love AI art and I love doing it. And he said, you ought to start doing it. You could do all sorts of sketches with it. And I said, well, I could. I said, but it totally misses the point of why I sketch. <laughs> I mean, you know, I don't I don't need something else sketching for me that's not the <laughs> you're like I need to do it myself <laughs> but it, it, it's all like yes you can buy a sketchbook in the store that's very nice but making something like that it's the process of like you said soaking the papers and punching holes in the cards and actually putting the th- you know the thread through them or the twine yeah, I mean all of that color and the beads yeah. and that stuff yeah that whole process is its own meditation. It's its own. There's a satisfaction to that that can't be replaced. Yes. And I think that that's 
really an important aspect to any of these practices. And yes, there's shortcuts to get something that looks like what you're looking for, but that's not what you're, that's not what the point of doing it is. Yeah, that's not the goal. And it's like, you know, when I started paper crafting last year, and I had made books and journals before Mm because I learned how in school and whatnot, but when I started actually playing with paper and watching videos where other people were making books and things, it was because I was in a place where I was deeply stressed. (laughs) And I, and the process of picking papers, looking at the colors and the designs and tearing them into either the shape I wanted or an intuitive shape, and then putting them back together again in a different way was what mattered. And it was just that whole experience that helped me move my mindset from one thing to another. And so by the end of the month, I had a journal and I also wasn't stressed anymore. (laughs) So (laughs) it was therapeutic in every way. (laughs) I think that that's where all of that stuff ends up being so important because in the end, so many people end up just sort of staring at screens all the time and just almost getting paralyzed I think a lot of people have been traumatized by like I never watch the news anymore for example because the whole point of it is to the point of it is to stress you so you'll watch and to push your buttons and say oh my gosh what's going on I need to watch this and it's something you can't do anything about and so it ends up just being something that makes you have stress on top of whatever other stresses you might have yeah and perhaps instead of watching that it's better to like start tearing paper or gluing paper together or dripping paint or knitting or whatever kind of creative outlet that you want to do and i think that that's an important thing for anybody yeah, um, I agree. And I think that it's, it's, I, I don't, and I think that's why people are still interested in, in those sorts of things. It's, it's sort of like, yes, I could do this cheaper some other way. It's kind of like candle making. Yes, I could buy candles really cheap, but sometimes it's really fun to like play in wax and play with different colors and, and that sort of thing. Any kind of hobby like knitting, you, yeah, it's fun to play around and see what you get with your fabrics or yeah. with your with your fibers and that sort of thing it's the point is not to buy you know a cheap scarf at, yeah. at you know whatever name insert store name here it's the process of making it there's something special about that too yeah 100 percent. like anytime i make a scarf or a hat or a quilt a quilt or um what are, what are the other things people think are are easier just to go by um I don't know but when I make that stuff 100% could go to Target and just buy one way cheaper Uh buy a lot (laughs) 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 making one blanket is expensive (laughs) if you do it yourself but the point the point is not that I that I need a blanket because I'm cold it's that I want to create this thing that I can then you know, see, know that I made it, feel it, touch it, you know, Mm -hmm. cut the pieces apart and put them back together and then, you know, be able to use it after, you know, um, and enjoy it and appreciate it in a very practical day-to-day kind of way, which I like, you know, Mm -hmm. and sketching is kind of that same way too. If you're doing it day-to-day or, you know, several times a week, that's something you're, a process you're appreciating you know, as part of your daily life and you're getting to use the materials on a daily basis and, um, you know, Mm -hmm. use that part of your brain. And, and I think that's something that not enough people understand or, or do. And I think they would gain a lot of benefit from that, but unfortunately we're kind of taught that those things aren't important or that you're sort of indulgent if you want to make art or make crafts when you could just go do it, you know, faster or, more cheaply some other way and I think that's unfortunate because I think everybody would benefit from it um in a lot of ways well there's there's it used to be obviously before you everybody had a camera you know people kept journals and sketchbooks more because you couldn't really record something in another way Mm -hmm. but now they're finding out that and that when you observe something if you actually draw it even if it's badly drawn you actually take in what it is like and badly drawn is a very 
subjective <laughs> term. You know, so many people when they see you out sketching say, oh, I can't sketch at all. And it's and it's not true. Anybody can draw. Um, and I don't think people should be scared away from sketching because they don't feel like that they're a professional artist. Yeah. It's okay. just jumping in with both feet and you're, there's only one you. I mean, I always tell students that all the time, that the most important thing we have to offer is our ideas. And it doesn't matter what your art style is. It doesn't matter how you execute it. If you don't have good ideas, it doesn't matter. Yeah. And that's true with sketching too. The important thing is the part of you that you're putting into it, whether it's mm -hmm. quote, I hate the terms good or bad because yeah, everything has its quality. I agree. And, and it's all, it's not, I think people want to compare themselves to other people. And the only person you should compare yourself to is you. Exactly. Uh, because, you know, I, so I used to do martial arts, right. And I would sketch the kids, you know, in the class before me so that I, you know, have something to do while I waited for my class. And the parents would come by and, oh, you know, you're so good. You're so talented. I could never, I can't even draw a straight line. I can't draw. I'm like, you can draw, but you haven't practiced drawing. And I'm not talented. I've just put a lot of time and energy into this skill, right? Like anyone can put the time and energy in, you know, you guys are studying martial arts you've been studying it for six years you're way better at it than me because I've only been doing it a year so it's the same thing it's just that I've been doing this and you've been doing that so um but they like to not that they like to tell themselves but they do tell themselves that that artistic talent is a different thing and it's not it's just a skill yeah. that you learn exactly and it's it's something that I, I wish more people took pleasure in and even not as a commercial endeavor i mean it's the the one thing that's kind of depressing is that with crafting or whatever the push that if you are what people deem as good at it they want you to monetize it mm -hmm. and to me there's no shame in doing something and not monetizing it like if i want to knit a sweater or if i want to play music or if i want to do whatever i decide to do as a hobby there, you should not be pressured to make it into a hustle. I agree completely. Yeah. The gosh, I, I've never been less interested in doing art as the times I've tried to make it a monetary thing. Uh -huh. uh, and because, you know, that's not how I started to do it. And I, I started doing it as a kid because I like to draw yeah dresses because <laughs> I like drawing dresses. You know what I mean? And it was fun. <laughs> so. Totally. And that, you know, evolved over the years and, you know, and I've tried the, you know, sort of commission-based work thing and I've decided I don't like it. I don't mm -hmm. want to have to do that. I I will occasionally do them on request for people who know me or friends, um, but it's like a one-off. I don't, I don't sell services like on the regular. So, because mm -hmm. um, I think it just, it's exhausting and I think it takes, it takes away the part that I find enjoyable and makes it all about somebody else and not about myself, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and things like art and, you know, crafts, especially people undervalue the labor that goes into that. Um, and they're like, Oh, you could sell these for like 20 bucks. I'm like, mm, well, it no. costs me 75 <laughs> to make plus the 15 hours I spent on it. So, you know, I'm mm -hmm. not a business. I don't buy the supplies wholesale. So. <laughs> And perhaps that's that's why people don't value a lot of that stuff because you buy it so cheap at Target mm -hmm. or whatever. You don't realize what's gone into it. Yeah. Um, and the ones at Target were probably made on machines. <laughs> so, you know, it it's totally different than having a handcrafted item mm -hmm. somebody put a lot of care into. So, mm -hmm. And there's something special about that when you make something like that. There's There's some sort of uh, thoughtfulness that's imbued into it that mm -hmm. you don't get from other things I mean I love handmade things because of how much effort people put into them yeah that's why I only give them now as gifts right mm -hmm. and I always and I have a rule I never make 
a craft or a piece of artwork for somebody else if I'm in a bad mood <laughs> because then I feel like I'm imbuing their gift with negativity and I yes. absolutely hate that idea so you want it to be like a totem that's good yeah, exactly. <laughs> well on that note I think we've been talking for over half an hour so is there anything that you'd like to say in closing oh man um just that you know if you know if you're coming to the concept of sketching for the first time and um you know trying to get into it to just you know take it easy and like I said before don't look at other people who've been doing it for years and compare yourself just be inspired by them but focus on yourself because that's the person who matters in this process and and just enjoy it like you just you know let yourself you know run away with your ideas and use the supplies in ways that you know maybe you'll find surprising um but yeah just uh just enjoy it and let it let it be fun well thanks so much for joining us noelle and thanks again for helping uh edit the book i'm really excited for people to read it and oh, me too. <laughs> i know everybody's it's really so excited good. about it <laughs> But thank you so much. And um, everybody, we'll, I'm going to be trying to do this every two weeks. And so I have some other people lined up. I w should have a list on the Patreon pretty soon of who's going to be coming up in January. But thanks so much for joining us, Noelle. Thank you. Thank you for having me.